evening. I'd like to acknowledge the Indigenous owners of the land on which we gather and meet this evening and pay my respects to Elders, past, present and emerging. Welcome to the annual lecture in Political Science and International Studies. My name's Professor Catherine Gelber and I'm the head of the School of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Queensland. I'd like to welcome all of you this evening, including Senator the Honourable Penny Wong, Leader of the Opposition in the Senate and Shadow Minister, Senator Claire Moore, Senator for Queensland, Senator Murray Watt, Senator for Queensland, members of the Consular Corps, Mr Peter Varghese, AO, Chancellor of University of Queensland, members of the University Senate and the University Senior Management Group, representatives from government and industry, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. We are very honoured to host this event this evening, which we see as an important contribution to public debate on vital topics to do with governance and governing in the 21st century in Australia and globally. We see this event as a small attempt to enhance the quality of that debate. We're facing, facing a crucial time in international democratic politics when core liberal institutions are being challenged by forms of politics that seek to question their legitimacy, undermine their validity and question the basis on which they operate. In some quarters, political rhetoric has become caustic, seeking to separate informed public debate from evidence and reasoning. Yet there are others who in this context are striving to redress the balance and facilitate important conversations about where the country and the globe are headed. In that context, we're very proud to host this event, which seeks to help facilitate a political culture which promotes critical reasoning, independent thinking and problem solving. A culture which rests on, requires even, evidence and facts. A culture which supports and embodies the best of public discourse. And the reason we do this is because these are the kinds and standards of debates that we need. This is what will enable us all to meet and address current and future global challenges. And so we look forward this evening to an address and without any further ado, I will ask the Chancellor of the University of Queensland, Peter Varghese, AO, to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Well, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and good evening to all of you, and may I uh, add my very warm personal welcome to uh, each of you and to uh, say how delighted we are you could join us for uh, the 2019 uh, lecture in political science and international studies. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Senator the Honourable Penny Wong. Uh, as Catherine has said, these are challenging times for anyone dealing with international relations. Uh, to adapt a phrase from the late Tom Wolfe, I think in many respects we're facing a bonfire of certainties. Uh, whether it's the strains that our rules-based international order are under, whether it's the tone and substance of US-China relations, whether it's the rise of authoritarian leaders off the back of identity politics and populism, whether it's a slowdown in global growth, there are so many reasons why our current international environment, in my view, is probably as uncertain as it has been since the Second World War. So for anyone seriously grappling with foreign policy, uh, these will remain testing times. Uh, and I can think of no one better placed to address some of these issues than our speaker tonight, Senator Penny Wong. Uh, Penny, as you know, uh, is the leader of the opposition in the Senate, the shadow foreign minister. She brings to the job uh, a range of experiences, including as a senior minister in the Rudd and Gillard governments, uh, work earlier in her career as a lawyer in industrial relations and as a union official. Uh, but most importantly, Penny Wong is a serious 
policy thinker. And at a time when distraction seems to characterize much of our political culture, it's important that we have more serious policy thinkers amongst our political leaders. Uh, like any serious politician, she comes to issues with her values and her worldview, and that's her starting point, but in my experience, Penny is also one of those who is very much open to evidence-based policy making, which means that her ending point may not always be where her starting point is. Uh, Penny is particularly well placed, I think, to talk about the international environment. Her personal life story has given her a close association with the region. She was born in Malaysia and came to Australia uh, as a young child and in her time as Minister for Climate Change was actively involved in many difficult and delicate uh, negotiations. Uh, I'm delighted that Senator Wong will also take some questions at the end of her speech. Delighted for two reasons. One is because you'll be able to see further evidence of her approach to policy, but also because having been at the receiving end of a lot of forensic questioning from <laughs> Senator Wong during estimates, uh, I'll take a certain quiet pleasure in watching <laughs> the roles reserved. So uh, it's a great pleasure for me to invite Senator the Honourable Penny Wong to deliver the 2019 Pulsus Lecture. Well, that was a very generous introduction, Peter. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I have to say, one of the things I did say to my staff as we were driving over was I actually think Peter Varghese was the best performer at estimates that I'd ever dealt with, so there you go. <laughs> I only managed catching him once, I think, which is disappointing. <laughs> Can I first acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging? Can I thank you, Q, Catherine, uh, uh, and in particular the Chancellor Peter Varghese for the uh, opportunity to speak with you. A few other acknowledgements, my parliamentary colleagues, um, my uh, Senator Claire Moore, who's the Shadow Minister for International Development in the Pacific, Senator Murray Watt, who's a fellow Senator also from Queensland, uh, and members of the Consular Corps, uh, thank you for your attendance today. I also acknowledge a great many senior members of the university community from the University Senate and the Senior Management Group, to all distinguished guests and to all of you, thank you so much for the opportunity to give this 2019 annual lecture in political science and international studies. It certainly is a privilege to be here. Students and academics from this university do contribute to national debate in many areas, and certainly in foreign policy, I do point to the contribution of your Chancellor, Peter Varghese, who, as you know, not only is the former Secretary of the, D of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, but recently led the development of the India Economic Strategy 2035. It's a strategy which charts a course for deeper and broader economic engagement between Australia and India, and its recommendations are supported by Labor, particularly because of its alignment with the ambitious, ambitions of our future Asia initiatives. But tonight I want to talk to you about foreign policy and international development. And I start with the foundations of Labor's foreign policy. Our foreign policy is founded on the belief that we deal with the world as it is and we seek to change it for the better a foreign policy that is not just transactional, but is purposive. And those purposes are defined by our values, by our interests, and by our identity. We know what we stand for, compassion, equality, fairness, democratic principles, and the protection of rights. We know what our interests are, the security of the nation and its people, the prosperity of the nation and its people, a stable, peaceful region anchored in the rule of law and constructive internationalism. And we know who we are, an inclusive, diverse nation which draws strength from the waves of immigrants who have come to our continent 
and our First Nations peoples. Our foreign policy will speak to who we are, the confidence we have in ourselves, the values we believe in, and to the region and world in which we wish to live. Labor recognises that our international development program is a key element of Australian foreign policy and that it reflects a key element of the Australian character, the generous nation of a fair go. So together with Labor Shadow Minister for International Development and the Pacific, my colleague Senator Moore, I have been working to develop and articulate our agenda for Australia's international development program. In 2017, our International Development Caucus Working Group undertook consultations with key aid and development stakeholders, and that has, work has been invaluable. It has contributed to our understanding of the sector's concerns with the current aid program, and it has contributed to shaping the objectives, strategies and actions for a shortened Labor government. But let's start with where we are. I haven't used the phrase bonfire of certainties, but I've expressed similar views, perhaps in somewhat less visually interesting language. <laughs> the current global context is one characterised by disruption. Changes in the balance of economic and strategic power, economic and social inequality, rising nationalism, challenges to the liberal based, rules based order and many other factors are reshaping our world. This disruption is compounded by a humanitarian crisis of an unprecedented scale. Globally, over 65 million people are displaced, more than those displaced as in the aftermath of World War II. And in these circumstances, Australia's international engagement, including our international development program, is of even greater importance. At a time when our national interest compels us to strengthen our engagement, the Abbott-Turnbull-Morrison government has not only neglected Australia's international development program, but has sav savagely attacked it. Since the, its election in 2013, the aid budget has been on an ever-diminishing trajectory. Over $11 billion has been slashed from Australia's aid budget to date, including more than $140 million in the most recent budget update. Currently, overseas development assistance sits at 0.22% of gross national income. This is set to fall to 0.19% in 2021-22, and forecasts indicate that by 2026-2027, this figure will fall to just 0.16%, which is the lowest on record. That is 16 cents in every $100 of national income. The Minister for Finance recently confirmed this government's cuts to Australia's international development program amount to $80 billion over the medium term to 2028-29. These cuts have not only had a very real impact on the people who benefit from investments in areas like health and education, they have damaged Australia's reputation as a reliable partner in the region and lessened Australia's influence precisely at the same time our national interest compels us to engage more deeply. This government's willingness to cut aid to this extent means that repairing Australia's international development program is beyond our collective reach in the short term. We have consistently called for a return to bipartisanship, a bipartisan approach to Australia's international development program. Half a century of bipartisanship has been cast aside. And at a time when nationalism and populism is again on the rise, parties of government do need to come together to demonstrate that investment in international development does not come at the expense of domestic prosperity. Rather, it contributes to it. But those calls have gone ignored in a time of ultra-partisanship, when the legitimate concerns of Australians struggling with low wage growth and cuts to services can be irresponsibly exploited to undermine the importance of our aid program that this is being undertaken by the same people who have delivered record low wage growth and cuts to schools and hospitals underlines the cynical use of nationalistic rhetoric. Of course, this isn't a phenomenon unique to Australia, with trends towards nationalism and populism sweeping democracies around the world, and these are driven by many factors. But one thing we do know is that inequality is a central factor. Labor's agenda of a fair go for all Australians is an expression of Labor values, but it is also necessary to protect the health of our democracy. By working to address inequality at home, we can foster the public support necessary to build Australia's international development program, 
so that it once again reflects the generous spirit of the Australian people. And we must. The region requires it and so too does our national interest. Labor believes Australia can show humanity, decency and compassion to ensure a fair go for all at home, on our doorstep and abroad. Australians are generous. In 2018, we ranked second in the World Giving Index behind only Indonesia, a reflection of the Australian willingness to help a stranger donate to charity and to volunteer. And our international development program should once again reflect the generous spirit of the Australian people. It is something we should be proud of. Development assistance must contribute to our national interests and reflect our values, and it can and should serve development objectives and broader strategic goals. Rather than seeing humanitarian and national interest goals as a binary, the starting point for our international development program should be the kind of region we want. A region which retains a system of institutions, rules and norms to guide behaviour, enable collective action and to resolve disputes. A region in which those seeking to make or shape rules do so through negotiation, not imposition. A region with an open trading system and investment transparency so as to maximise opportunity. A region where outcomes are not determined only by power. A region where all people live in peace and prosperity. Now we know that poverty alleviation is a necessary, although not sufficient, foundation of stability and prosperity. And democratic governance and human rights are critical to sustainable development and to lasting peace. So a region with these characteristics reflects our national interests and our values. Supporting and strengthening such a region will require better coordination of Australia's engagement across government, NGOs, academia and the private sector. Aid is a key enabler of development, but we must work to bring together other elements of Australian engagement, diplomacy, trade, labour mo mobility and private sector investment. Th recognising this will require a change in mindset in both the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the development sector. All of us with a stake in international development must come together and align our engagement so that Australia's contribution has maximum impact in these disrupted times. Better alignment and coordination will be a key imperative for an incoming Labor government. Under a shortened Labor government, the objective of our international development program will be to promote sustainable economic development, poverty reduction and inclusive development in a way that reflects our values and supports our national interests. This purpose cannot be achieved without addressing the declining trajectory of Australia's aid budget. And we do not underestimate the task of rebuilding the International Development Assistance Program. At Labor's national conference in December, the party adopted an amendment to the platform which committed us to increasing official development assistance as a percentage of GNI every year we are in office, starting with our first budget. But the damage done by the current government is substantial and rebuilding the program will not be achieved in one year or in one term of government. It is a fiscal challenge, a long-term challenge, but most of all, it is a political challenge. Pauline Hanson, who you send us. <laughs> it's my favourite joke to Murray Watt. <laughs> Continues to call for the entire development assistance budget to be cut. She says Australia is shamefully wasting billions on overseas handouts to corrupt governments and unaccountable NGOs. It is a call, call sadly echoed by some members of the LNP. And I say this to you tonight. All of us who believe in a strong, secure, prosperous and generous Australia must push back. We must articulate why Australia's international development program matters. It matters to the lives of those in our region. It matters to our influence in the region and it matters to our national interest. Our international development program has not only been undermined by cuts to budget, but also by a reduction in the capacity of our public service to deliver it. The loss of leadership and technical expertise affects our ability to maximise the impact of our aid spend. There has been a gro growth in the use of managing contractors under the current government, with just 10 companies now managing 20% of the aid budget. 
Greater outsourcing of our international development program gives rise to the legitimate concern that these arrangements are driven more by a lack of capacity or risk aversion rather than a focus on improved development outcomes. In 2013, the Abbott government abolished AusAid. But as I said in my speech to the Council for International Development Conference in November 2017, you can't unscramble that particular omelette. Instead, a shortened Labor government will focus on working with DFAT to build development capability and ensure it is prioritised and valued. Greater recognition of and demand for this capability will not only be good for the department, it will be good for the countries with whom we partner and good for Australians, increasing confidence that taxpayers' dollars are achieving the intended outcomes and supporting our national interests. We will examine the way aid is structured and governed within the department to ensure it is managed appropriately and effectively. And we want to rebuild and reward aid and development skills. Encouraging and, attra and attracting people with development skills in the department, those who have ex expertise in specific areas or thematic areas, and who understand what works in low and middle income countries. We would expect graduates to be trained in the basics of aid design and management, just as they are trained in the basics of the department's other areas of work. We would expect senior officers to gauge, engage with and draw upon external expertise in designing and implementing development programs, just as we would expect those with aid and development skills to be adept at policy development, diplomacy and strategic thinking. And there should be flexibility within the department and across the public service to draw upon specific skills and expertise when needed. I have spoken elsewhere at some length of the economic dimension to the strategic shifts we are witnessing. These give rise to two key imperatives. The first is a greater capacity within DFAT to integrate economic analysis and diplomacy as a core function and a stronger capacity to harness the various aspects of Australian economic engagement, both government and private sector, towards our strategic objectives. To this end, a shortened Labor government will invest in the department's geoeconomic capacity and expect that the new councillor positions that we have announced will play a key role in country to ensure our development, trade, investment and diplomatic policies are integrated. Good diplomacy has never been an abstract art. And in today's world, the deployment of the full gamut of Australian engagement is even more critical. Our development assistance programs across the region should be visible to and coordinated with the various Australian enterprises operating there. And Labor will encourage and reward officers who undertake postings in Asia and the Pacific. Such postings should be highly valued in career progression. And further, the skills and experience and expertise of locally engaged staff are an asset which must be valued, utilised and built upon. Labor will also work to improve communication and transparency in Australia's aid program by ensuring transparency standards are sufficient and represent a level playing field for all delivery partners and by providing project level information for all projects and programs above a million dollars. Achieving the best value for taxpayer funds must be an overriding objective in the delivery of the program. We also will better communicate results of Australia's investment to the Australian public, so Australians can see the impact of their tax dollars and have confidence they are being spent wisely. Australia's international development program should be focused and targeted where Australia can have the most impact and influence, and that is our own region. This reflects our interests, our capabilities and our strengths. Bill Shorten made clear that the, has made clear that the Pacific is a priority for Labor. We see the region as, in the words of the Pacific leaders, one blue Pacific continent, Australia's front yard. We believe in a deep and comprehensive partnership with Pacific nations in which Australia is a responsible and constructive partner. We can be the natural partner of choice for, for Pacific nations, but we cannot take this for granted. In Papua New Guinea, one of our closest and most important neighbours, we invest over $550 million in aid annually. And we should all be concerned that despite this, PNG still has some of the poorest social and development indicators in the world. This apparent lack of return on investment leads some to advocate scaling back our aid budget even further but we can't turn our back on the real needs of some of our closest friends and neighbours. I do believe that this makes clear a fresh approach is needed. 
So if elected, we will work in partnership with the government of Papua New Guinea to examine whether our aid dollar is having the best impact possible. Unlike the coalition, Labor's increased focus on the Pacific will not come at the expense of key partners in South and Southeast Asia. In fact, it is irresponsible and counter to the national interest to raid programs in one group of our partner nations to fund others. Supporting and building the Pacific region to the detriment of other nations won't serve our relationships, our influence, nor our long-term prosperity and security. There are some who dismiss the need to continue giving aid to middle-income countries. Can I say I disagree? As the World Bank outlines, middle-income countries are a diverse group by size, population and income level, home to 5 billion of the world's 7 billion people. They represent about one third of global GDP and are major engines of global growth. And they are also home to 73% of those living in poverty in today's world. I speak of countries which include Indonesia, Malaysia and the Philippines. Across Southeast Asia, extreme poverty has fallen and this is a good thing. And there are now 36 million people living on $1.90 US, uh, US dollars $1.90 per day, but there is more to be done. Those living on incomes between $1.90 and $10 a day still comprise a significant percentage of the populations of many of our neighbours, and they are highly vulnerable to economic setbacks. Gains that are being made have not necessarily led to a reduction in, an, in, in inequality, and their situation is compounded by myriad challenges, including conflict and violence, compounded by inadequate justice systems, urbanisation and a lack of access to natural resources, natural disasters and the closing space for civil society. In addition, countries face structural imbalances, economic imbalances, structural weaknesses and often complicated development pathways. These may halt or reverse economic gains. So aid and technical assistance can continue to play an important role in supporting our neighbours' efforts to achieve development outcomes. It can also help ensure that no one gets left behind. The pledge at the heart of the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I do not believe Australia's interest is served by lessening engagement with those countries in our region who have achieved some economic development. Because development challenges change, but they do not disappear. So we recognise the importance of aid to middle income countries. And in our view, Australia's development assistance should leverage our strengths, be tailored to each country, recognise different circumstances and needs and our different roles and relationships. In some countries, for some objectives, traditional grant aid may be the best way to achieve an outcome. In others, a combination of grants, government-backed development financing, public-private partnerships and private sector engagement will be the most effective. And in other case, Australian technical assistance or expert advice may best achieve our goals. We want to work in partnership with our neighbours and we want to work in close coordination with like-minded partners, leveraging our respective expertise, funding and presence to enable an effective division of labour. So just as I made the case for leveraging Australia's comparative advantage in the context of our trading relationships when I was trade spokesperson. We must also look to how Australia's strengths, experience and expertise can be drawn on to maximise the benefit of our international development program. Health, education, climate change, infrastructure and gender equality and inclusion will be central themes for Australia's international development program under Labor. And I want to focus initially on health because health outcomes in our region continue to be unacceptable. The recent outbreaks of polio in Papua New Guinea are evidence of this. The maternal mortality rate in Australia in 2016 was 8.5 deaths per 100,000 women giving birth. In Papua New Guinea, that number is 215. 99% of all maternal deaths occur in developing countries. Investment in healthcare and family planning improves individual wellbeing and contributes to prosperity and stability in communities and country. Aid can and does make a difference. For example, consider Timor-Leste. The infant mortality rate is 41 per 1,000 live births. That's still too high. It compares to 3.1 deaths per 1,000 live births in Australia. 
but it is down from 131 in 1990. So that is a lot of lives saved. A recent study by PwC for the Fred Hollows Foundation found that every dollar invested in vision contributes $4 to the local developing economy. And that's why when we were last in government in 2008, the Rudd Labor government deployed a consortium approach to deliver the Avoidable Blindness Initiative. Unfortunately, the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government has reduced annual aid expenditure on eye health by approximately 41% over the last four years. So as part of our focus on health, I announced today that a short and label government will invest $32 million in a Pacific Avoidable Blindness and Vision Loss Fund. This investment will clear the backlog of cataract blindness across the Pacific. It will enable the treatment of over 19,000 people with the most severe cases of visual impairment and it will train up to 600 additional health workers across the region to deliver programs on the ground. It is an initiative which plays to our strengths and an initiative underpinned by a consortium approach with potential organisations including the Fred Hollows Foundation, Vision 2020 and the Royal Australian and New Zealand Colleges of Ophthalmologists. Climate change and infrastructure, this is an area I really do want to focus on if we are elected, and an area which has been underdone given the ideological position taken by too many in the current government. we we'll start with a central proposition, which is quality infrastructure is key to economic development and future prosperity, and we know that many in our region have substantial unmet need. So in response, we need more innovative financing mechanisms in order to enable Australia to work in partnership with nations to provide them with the ability to meet their development aspirations. Last year, Bill Shorten announced that Labor intends to establish a government-supported infrastructure financing facility, and we were very pleased when Mr Morrison subsequently announced similar intentions. I know there are some who are concerned in the sector about the model that the current government has outlined. Can I say a Labor government will work with the aid and development sector to ensure the implementation of a model that is fit for purpose and contributes effectively to our development goals in line with our values and national interests. But while this work continues, we would seek to utilise the mechanisms that are established by the current government as a starting point. But beyond funding, our support for infrastructure would also offer capacity building, job opportunities and training, support for governance and project management and technical assistance to help achieve the right design arrangements and the right financing arrangements, including to ensure climate resilience. While much of the infrastructure financing will be focused on the Pacific, we have made clear that under a Labor government, there will be opportunities to finance and assist with infrastructure in Southeast Asia as well. As a disaster prone region, we can support climate resilient infrastructure and systems. And we want to work with our neighbours to ensure their infrastructure is, is sustainable and resilient as we go forward. This is the right thing to do, but it is also part of our work to restore Australia's credibility and reputation as a creative, collaborative and energetic, energetic member of the community of nations committed to addressing climate change because we recognise the reality of climate change. And we understand that it is a lived experience, particularly for many of our friends and neighbours. Supporting personal and financial security for women is critical to gender equality. And ultimately, the full participation of women in the economy and in government will, be only achieved, will only be achieved when women are confident and secure in their most fundamental rights. I am concerned by the government's refusal to sign the UN International Women's Day Statement, particularly by reports that we withheld support for the statement because of its access to safe abortion. Labor has made clear we believe reproductive choice and access to basic health care as integral parts of achieving gender equality. A strong civil society is vital to democracy, inclusion, transparency and openness. It's vital to accountability and the protection of minorities and marginalised groups. So if elected, a shortened government will engage with civil society not only as partners in the delivery of projects, but to support and strengthen the work that they do and the role they play in their own countries. 
and our engagement with civil society will include non-government organisations, business and professional associations, unions, women's organisations, media and religious institutions. Ensuring their viability is more pressing in the face of rising authoritarianism, the shrinking space for civil society and increasing attacks on the freedom of the press across many parts of our region. So Labor will significantly increase the annual base grant for fully accredited NGOs in the Australian NGO Cooperation Program at a cost of $32 million over the forward estimates. It is in an increase which reflects our commitment to working with NGOs to strengthen Australia's aid delivery and it also reflects our recognition that non-government organisations play a vital role in engaging with civil society. To advance and protect those with disability, LGBTIQ, ethnic and religious minorities and other human rights, Labor will also appoint a human rights ambassador. We want to build the capacity of trade unions abroad to ensure people have access to fair and decent work and rights at work are better protected. Our support for civil society also recognises the role and responsibility business has, both in enabling development and ensuring human rights are protected overseas. So we will de develop a national action plan on business and human rights and strengthen the national contact point, that is the body that works to address human rights abuses by Australian businesses and examines ways to provide better guidance to Australian companies on managing their requirements and their obligations. So I end where we started. We are living in a time of disruption and the magnitude and nature of change shapes Australia's strategic, economic and foreign policy interests. Accompanied by a humanitarian crisis of unprecedented scale, it is essential that Australia's international development program meets the challenges of these times. So a Labor government will rebuild Australia's international development program we will reverse the declining trajectory of the budget. We will rebuild capability. And most of all, we wish to restore consensus. And our international development program will speak to who we are, the confidence we have in ourselves, the values we believe in, and the world and region in which we want to live. Thank you very much.